started. Um, the last time we were talking about issues involving probability, one of the examples that I gave you was this idea of a probability tree. In other words, if we had if we had one event, you know, that could be a yes or a no. Um, uh, well, it, for each one of those outcomes, then the second event, being independent, not knowing what the first event was, could also be a yes or no, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth, going all the way down the line, maybe 10 times, 20 times, and so on. So one of the examples we gave of that is flipping a coin, which is 50-50, right? So <clears throat> I'm just going to draw that quickly here. So if we, if we have a situation where we flip a coin, it could be either heads or tails on the first spin. This is the first flip of the coin, right? It could be either heads or tails. And then on the second flip of the coin, well, that second flip of the coin could also then be heads or tails. Or tails, head, whoops, and then here. If it was heads, it could be heads or tails next. If it were tails, it could be heads or tails next. And then also heads or tails. If we're, oops, am I doing this? Am I, yeah, I think I'm overdoing this. Heads, nope, that's right. Could be heads, heads. Uh, Actually, I'm going to start that again. I overdrew it. It's my addled brain on cough medicine, I think. <clears throat> okay, first flip could either be heads or it could be tails. Okay, so then if it's heads, the second flip could then be either heads. Whoops. Heads, or the result could be tails. And that first flip, if the first flip were tails, the second flip could be heads or tails, right? These are these are the four possible outcomes that we could have from flipping a coin twice, right? Two heads, a head and a tail, a tail and a head, or a tail and a tail. That's like each one of the different possibilities. And each one's a C equal likelihood because the probability is 50% of either one of them. And then on the third flip, well, if we had had heads, he heads and heads on the first two flips, coins unaware of what was flipped before, so that result could be either a heads or a tails. And if it had been a head and a tail, then the next result could be a head and a tail. And if we're a tail and a head, the next result could be a head or a tail. And the next result could be a head. If there were tails and tails, the next result could be a head or a tail. So what do we wind up here with here? We wind up if we only go three deep, and we could continue this for five, that, 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 that 20, we could continue this as much as we want, right? So each one of these being, being an equal probability, we could calculate what the likelihood is that we get any particular outcome. Like there's only one way to get three heads, right? You gotta get heads, heads, and heads. So there's only one way that that could occur. Well, how about <clears throat> two heads and a tail? Heads, heads, tails, that's one. Heads, tails, heads. That's two heads, that's one. Heads, oh, okay. How about tails, heads, heads? That's one. So there are three ways. Uh, there's one way we can get three heads. Right, it's only one way. There are three ways that we can get two heads. Uh, excuse me, two heads. There are three ways that that can occur. Okay, and how about, let's see, how about only one head? In other words, two tails. Okay, heads, heads, tails, tails. That's one way. Uh, let's see, tails, tails, heads, that's another way. And there should be another one here. Which one am I missing? Tails, head, tails, that's another way. So there's three ways we can get one head. Okay, and what about tails, so all tails? Well, just like all heads, there's only one way for that to occur. And that's all three, uh, all three are tails. So in other words, zero heads, we'll call that. Okay, that's only one, one way that occurs. So there are eight possible outcomes here. So each one of these outcomes is equally likely. So there is one over eight chances we'll get three heads in a row. There's one over eight chances we'll get three tails in a row. And there are three out of eight. And three out of eight chances we'll get two heads and one tail or two tails and one head. Okay, so all that adding up to the total probability, the sum of all this, since you know these are all exclusive, they're gonna, gonna have to add them all together. And that's gonna be one. Right, probability is one. It's going to have to be one of those things. Okay, well, in fact, since it's 0.5 and 0.5, it, since the first first uh, head is 0.5, second one's 0.5, third one's 0.5, 
the probability is 1 8th, 0 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5, or 1 8th, or in other words, 0.125. You could actually calculate it that way if you wanted. And each of these other three are 0.125. Three times it is 0.375, or 0.375. Same thing as the fraction that we got there. Okay, so that's pretty this is pretty convenient because, you know, all equal likelihoods, right? Now, what is the nature of this? Let's take a look at the nature of the variable that we have here, the result of a coin flip, right? So that is, let's see, that is a, that's a categorical variable, the head or a tail, right? Nominal categorical variable, the head or a tail. <clears throat> and how many possibilities do we have for each outcome? Only two, right? So that is a binomial, or sometimes they call it a dichotomous var uh, variable. I don't know if I spell that right. I, good, I, I scribble it so hard you can't tell if I spell it right anyway. So the uh, so that's dichotomous, can only have two values, right? That's a special situation. That comes up a lot because a lot of times we're looking at, in public health, <coughs> we're looking at a, 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 a outcome or a, um, uh, 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 or a condition which is dichotomous. You have diabetes or you don't have diabetes. You have cancer, you don't have cancer. You have heart disease, you don't have heart disease, right? Uh, of course, there's many nuances to that, and a lot of times we work with nominal variables and ordinal variables, but we work with dichotomous variables, binomials, a lot, quite a bit. <clears throat> so we're particularly interested in the math, the, the probabilities in the math that involve binomials. Now, this is not only useful for, <coughs> for uh, 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 things where the probabilities <coughs> of each outcome are the same, but it's also useful for situations where the outcome is not the same. So let's say that the probability of being diabetic uh, is equal to 0 0.1, 10%. 10% of the population has di diabetes. Okay, so let's start out. We pick a first person. That first person may have diabetes or may not have diabetes, right? And what's the probability? Probability have diabetes is 0.1. Probability don't have diabetes is 0.9. Okay, so the first person we picked was, uh, 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 had diabetes. Now, since we're doing a random sample, independent, uh, independent random sample, um, we're saying to myself, okay, so the next person I pick has no association with these, with the first person I pick, right? So they can either, the second person, that's the first person, the second person I pick may have diabetes or may not have diabetes. Again, that's 0.1 chance that have diabetes and it's 0 .0 0 0.9 chance uh, probability that they don't have diabetes. Again, and if the person, first person didn't have diabetes, Similarly, 0.1 and 0.9 for diabetes and no diabetes. Okay, what about the third person we pick? Similarly to what we did with the, uh, with the coin, okay, third person has the same probability. You have, may have diabetes, the probability that's 0.1. Probability of not having diabetes, 0.9 for that third person. And again, 0.1 for diabetes and 0.9 for no diabetes. 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, and 0 0.9. Okay, so now, what's the probability that I would choose three people that all have diabetes if I chose three all together at the same time, but, but sample them independently? Well, there's only one outcome for that. The first person has diabetes, second person has diabetes, second, third person has diabetes. Just like we did in class last week, What's that equal to? It's equal to 0.1 times 0.1 times 0.1, which is equal to 0 0.01. There's a one in a thousand chance or one, uh, one tenth of a percent chance that I would, that in this population, pick out three people that all have diabetes. Everybody comfortable with that? Makes sense, right? What about the probability that all three of them would not have diabetes? <coughs> well, that's 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 times 0 0.9. 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.9, and that is equal to, and I, my, again, the cough medicine is going to make me a little slow today, so I'm going to, uh, 
is my calculator 0.9 times 0.9 i could do the first part anyway but k is equal to 0.81 times 0.9 again is equal to 0.7 i'm going to call it 0.73 for our purposes 0.73 73 percent chance or probability of 0.73 <clears throat> well if i add them up i you know i've only accounted for 0.731 of the possible all the possible outcomes where are all the other possible outcomes well they're buried in here aren't they probability that we would have two people with diabetes is 0.1 times 0.1 times 0 0.9 0 0.9 probability uh for that possible how about how about diabetes no diabetes and diabetes that's also two 0.1 times 0.1 times 0.9 how about um the <clears throat> first person doesn't have diabetes, but the next two do. Well, that's also in a way we could get two out of that group, 0.1 times 0 0.1. And I could do the same thing now for people who don't have diabetes, uh, two out of three don't have diabetes, which would be 0.1 times 0 0.9 times 0 0.9, 0 0.1 times 0.9. And when we add that all together, it's going to add up to one. But if I asked you, what's the probability that all three would have diabetes? They'd say, oh, that's an easy one, Tony. That's 0 0.1 times 0.1 times 0.1. What's the probability that two out of, uh, that uh, two out of three people that you pick have diabetes? Well, that's going to be 0.1 times 0.1 times 0.9 times three, three times that, because there's three ways that that could happen. Well, what is that anyway? Let's see what that is, just for the hell of it. And you see, there could be the all the, all the other possibilities, two and one and so on and so forth. 0.1 times 0.1 times 0.9. is equal to 0 0.00, just a little under 1% chance that two out of the three would have diabetes, 0.09. Oh, I'm sorry, three times that, right? That'd be 0 0.027. Three times, that can happen three ways, right? So, so this is a pretty easy way for us to calculate what these probabilities are. What if I told you that we're gonna sample a random sample of 100 people from this population and I want to know what's the probability that I will get uh, exactly 12 people out of 100 that have diabetes. Okay, so how many pieces of paper do you think we would have to have to, to put this tree out? 12 levels, right? Not very practical, right? We need another better way to do this. We need a formula that, that, that gives us this probability so we don't have to work through all of these possible combinations of diabetic or not diabetic that also takes into account the probability of each outcome diabetes or no diabetes probability of getting a test answer right you know five questions you know nothing about it you randomly select that's 20 percent chance of getting it right 0.2 right so we, we we need something that will help us with that and in fact there is a formula binomial uh, distribution formula <coughs> which looks something like Let's see where I got it. Okay. Here we go. There it is. I'll open that up. I'll make it bigger so we can read it. Oh, maybe not. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> this is the probability. Probability that we have so many successes, so many people that have the condition that we're looking for. That a, <clears throat> that's a probability of X. So that would be 12 in our case if we said 12 out of 100. This, uh, this is the number of ways that the event can occur. In other words, that's the act. That's kind of like the sample size, right? That's 100 people, right? So n factorial. What does factorial mean? That means that number times the number below it times the number below it, like 100 times 99 times 98 times 97, and so on and so forth. Okay, and what's the, what do we have down here? The count, the number of ways the event can occur. That's n minus x, which is 100 minus. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, 12, um, which is uh, 88, which is 88 times 80, 87 times 86, and so on and so forth. And then here we have uh, uh, this deletes any duplications <coughs> that are involved here, okay, which is then it's going to be 12 times 11 times 10, and so on and so forth. And we're going to multiply that by the probability of each of the two events, probability, <coughs> probability that they have diabetes, which is 0.1 time to the x power the x power is the 12th power 
times the probability they don't have diabetes, which is 0.9 uh, uh, to the n minus x. Uh, that's the 100 minus 12, which is the 88th power. Okay, so is that a formula we would want to work out, like you know, by hand? Probably not, right? So I could ask you to apply this formula to our situation where you have three different people we'd sample, right? Probability that we get one out of three, right? That would be easy because probability of getting one would be equal to three factorials, three times two times one over three minus one or two times one times uh, one, one factorial, which is one times probability 0.1 to the first power times the pro 0.9 to the uh, to the uh, uh, three minus one is the second power. And you can work this out, right? 0.9 to the second power. You can work that out pretty easily. Right, probably as easily as recreating that tree, <clears throat> just by filling the numbers in. Problem is, is that for larger uh, uh, sample sizes, the the uh, uh, doing it by hand is not going to be very practical for us. Fortunately, Excel has functions for this, as does SPSS. But Excel really has a pretty simple way of doing this stuff. We're going to be taking a look at that in a second. But let's look at what, how this distributes. Okay, so. You'll notice that <clears throat> when I was working with the coin, I closed that page, unfortunately. <coughs> when I was working with the coin, I said, well, the probability of getting a head is 0.5. Probability of getting a tail is 0.5 also. OK, so let's say we, we wanted to see <coughs> we're going to do 100 trials. We're going to flip 100 coins. What's the most likely number of heads that we're going to get there? You flip a coin 100 times. How many times would you expect to get heads? 50, right? You expect 50 would be probably your most likely outcome, right? Would it be unlikely for you to get 49 or 48 or, or 51? No, that could happen, right? In fact, in fact, to get exactly 50 would probably be unusual. Right? I mean, if you really did this, you know, like in a casino, you play blackout all day, get to wind up at the end of the day exactly even. It's pretty, you know, pretty unlikely, right? So you're probably going to get a little less or a little bit more. But is it going to be more likely that you're going to get 49 or more likely you're going to get 40? Well, 40 is going to come up less than 49 because the most, you know, it's going to tend towards 50. So if I were to draw this as a distribution, and 60 also a little bit, a little bit less likely. The likelihood of getting 25 or 75 out of 100, that's really unlikely, right? Because, you know, it tends to tend towards the middle. So if I were going to stack these up based on how many coins I would expect to get, you know, how, out of 100, how often you would get a certain number, I would expect the biggest group in to be, in, be around, around 50. And then a little less often 49, and a little less often 48, or 47. And then as we got further and further away, they get less and less likely. So what are we getting here? We're getting this kind of bell-shaped curve, right? Everybody okay with that, that bell-shaped curve? Right, that's called the binomial distribution. Now, this distribution is a special distribution <coughs> because it's based on something, based on a distribution of results of a variable that are dichotomous. Right, because it's only got it only can have two values: yes or no, male or female, uh, diabetic, not diabetic, and so on and so forth. And also, if we were to draw this, let's say we would draw this for our situation where our we were talking about our whether a person was diabetic or not. Right. Well, the most likely outcome, if we sample 100 people, most likely outcome or probability of prevalence, which is where it's only the probability of having diabetes is only 10 percent. Right. Well, I have 100. We'd only the most frequent value we'd expect to be 10, right? And less less often nine, eight, five, fifteen, so on. And that might look more like something like this, okay? Where it's and then see it's kind of constrained there. It can't go below zero, right? Which is probably pretty unlikely, <coughs> even to get to zero. But then you could get more, right? It's kind of not really not really a perfect 
uh, a bell-shaped curve, right? We got, so this, this distribution is a little bit different than some of the others that <coughs> we're going to be dealing with, especially if the probability is not 25. <coughs> you, want, you want me to prove this to you physically? I'm going to play a video. Okay. This is a video. Any of you guys ever been to the Queens Museum of Science? New York Museum, I guess what is it called? New York Museum of Science or Queens Museum? It's by Flushing Meadow Park. It's like a giant science museum. They have like, you know, uh, uh, um, replicas of like Saturn V booster and all kinds of stuff outside. They have, they have a lot of uh, scientific-based demonstrations and exercises. It's great for kids. They got simulators and stuff like that. You know, like uh, 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 spacecraft simulators, that kind of stuff. They're playing with spacecraft simulators. One of the things that they had, there is a thing called a Galton machine. And what this is, is a scientist that put together a machine, Golden, <coughs> a statistician, put together a machine to demonstrate the binomial distribution. I can't get this bigger. Whoops. Okay. There's some music here, I think, in the background, but I'm not going to bother to you. So if you look here, how, what's happening here? What's happening here is up at the top here, <coughs> there's, a, there's a little hole. And there's a bunch of ball bearings, right? That come down into this little hole and they hit a bar that's directly below that little hole, right? When it hits that bar, that bar is centered perfectly under that hole. When it hits that bar, which way is it gonna go, right or left? Well, half the time it's gonna right, half the time it's gonna go left, right? Presumably if it's centered correctly, it's random. So it bounces off that bar. And then it comes down and it hits the next bar. And the next bar, which is alongside of it, the next bar, again, it could go left or right. And the next bar, left or right. Next bar, left. It's just like our coin experiment, right? Where would you expect most likely place for that ball to be when it winds up at the bottom? You'd expect it to be in the middle, right? Half the time going left, half the time going right. And then how often would you expect it to be a little bit to the left, like making a couple of extra left turns? Well, you know, pretty close to the same thing, but not, not quite as much. And how about a lot? How about all left turns? Well, that's not going to be likely, right? That's going to be very unlikely. So let's see what happens to these balls when they arrive at the bottom of this device. Let's put this away. <coughs> bing, 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 bing. You seem to come down here. Anybody ever hear of a pachinko machine? It's a Japanese like pinball machine. Bingo. Look at that. What happened here? <coughs> well, uh, you know, I wish I could make that go away when it's paused, but apparently not. <coughs> Maybe I can do it this way, yeah. What happened here? We actually see this 50-50 distribution, the same thing we just predicted our coin probability would do. Cool, right? Okay. So this device, this quilt machine, is demonstrating, physically demonstrating, that what I'm telling you is true, and you don't have to, you know, take my word for it. You, you actually see that this occurs in real life. That this is a real kind of, this is a real uh, 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 element of nature, probability in nature that we can actually demonstrate. <clears throat> and see the kid in the back there. He was sitting there. He he was over there for the whole time I was there, right? And you know what he was waiting for, right? He wanted to see what happened when it filled up, right? Like he wanted to see it flush out and start all over again. So he, he's, he's there for an hour at least. You know, so I don't, but apparently it was valuable enough for him to, I asked him about it, it was valuable enough for him to see that that happened, that, that he was going to stick there until it happened. So, okay, so let's take a look at this. <coughs> Let me do some examples for this now. The binomial distribution. Okay, how many of you guys have ever heard of the binomial distribution before? Anybody? Right, kind of distant past or something like that, maybe? How about you guys online? Any of you guys have heard of the binomial distribution? <coughs> I'm not getting any comments. I'm not sure anybody is online. Could just be you guys. No, I think we got more than we have here. They're shy. Okay, we have shy and retiring people online. No, they're not answering. Okay, let's read this. Study uh, indicates 10% of nursing home population, a diabetic, you randomly sample 10 patients. 
what's the likelihood that exactly one will be diabetic out of the 10 patients? Well, you know, we, we can easily predict exactly zero, right? Because that would mean, you know, 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.9, or exactly 10, all of them are diabetic. But now we got a problem, exactly one would be diabetic. Well, we need a tool to solve that. And I'm gonna open Excel. We can actually put those numbers, the N would be 10, number of trials, 10 patients, number of people we sample. We could use that as N in our formula, in our probability formula. We could use uh, um, uh, one, uh, one as X, because that's how many successes that we were looking for, how many people were diabetic, right? To meet our criteria out of the 10. And then the P and the Q would be the probability of diabetic, which is 0.1, and probability of not being diabetic, which is 0.9. So we could use those four numbers in that formula if we were willing to sit down and, and do the math. But now we got a better way to do that, or at least a more convenient way to do that. In Excel, among the uh, many other statistical functions that we have in Excel, is a binomial distribution function. Okay, oops, that's Word, I need Excel. There we go. Okay, let me blow this up. Okay, maybe we'll go look bigger. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at this. In Excel, there is a function equals binome dist. Okay, there's a couple of versions of it binome dist and binome dist, or negative binome dist. But we're, we're interested in binome dist. Okay. As soon as I hit the open parentheses, it's going to give me some hints. Parentheses. Notice the hints it gives me. Uh, trials, comma, probability of S, probability of success, comma, and, and cumulative, okay, which is, uh, that's either going to be true or false. And we're going to discuss that in, this, in just a second, but I'll, I want to get this first try out of, out of the way. And the probability should be in there, too, which yeah, uh, trials, probability, success, and cumulative. Okay, so number of trials. We have 10 people we've sampled, right? That's our number of trials, 10. Comma, what's the probability that any one of them has diabetes? 0.1, right? That's probability, success, probability that that seems weird to say, to determine, you know, to call something as a disease, as a, as a success. But in this sense, we, want, we mean it as they meet our criteria that they have diabetes. And then comma, and so we have the number of trials, the probability, uh, 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 I'm sorry, excuse me, I missed something there. The number of successes, which is one, we asked, oh, it's probably we would get one out of the number of trials, 10, comma, 0.1, which is the probability. There it is, number of successes, trials, probability of success, and cumulative. And cumulative, I'm going to put false for the moment. I'll explain that in a second. I'm going to enter. And the probability is 0 0.38742. If I had put those four numbers into that binomial equation, I would get the same result. So this is cool. I save a lot of work here, right, in, in using this function in Excel. Okay, what's the probability that two or less will be diabetic? Well, hang on one second. This is the probability that one person would be diabetic, right? What's the probability that none would be diabetic out of the 10, right? Well, I'm going to do that now. Equals <coughs> binome disk. I could do 0.1 times, uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, I could do non diabetic uh, 0.1 times 0.1 times 0.1, so on and so forth. Or I could uh, probably, uh, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. I could do 0.9 times 0.9. Let me think about this. Right. Probability that none are diabetic is, uh, is let's see, uh, probability binomial distribution, com. Open parentheses. Number of successes is zero, comma. The trials is ten, comma. The probability of success is 0 0.1, right? Because probability that is 0 0.1, comma. And cumulative. And like, like I said, my my cold medicine animal brain, Excel is is guiding me the right way. Okay, so I use false again. I'm going to hit enter, and it tells me the probability is 0 0.34. That's actually pretty probable, right? If the probability is only one in 10 people or 10%, the probability you'd pick 10 out, none of them are diabetic. That's not unusual. That wouldn't be unusual, would it? Right? However, you can see that the probability of getting one out of 10 
the same as the prevalence, is a bit more probable than getting uh, uh, none out of 10. But we asked, what was the question? The question was, what's the probability of getting two or fewer people, two or less that are diabetic? In other words, including two. So I'm gonna put two over here, right? And I'm gonna say, okay, let's figure out that probability. It's equal to binome this, parentheses, and the probability, the number of successes this time is two, number of trials is 10. The probability is 0.1 again, and I'm gonna say false again. And I'm going to close parentheses. And that probability is 19%. Notice that as we're going up now, probability is less and less. Probability getting four or five, three, four or five, is going to be less because prevalence is only 10%. Right? So the probability of getting two or fewer is going to be equal to the sum of these probabilities. It's going to be equal to about 93%. That's the likelihood I would get two or fewer. Which, if you think about it, makes sense, right? Because only one in ten, well, only ten percent of the population has it. So, two zero, two one or zero seems like the most likely outcomes <coughs> combined, right? So now, what about what's the next question I have here? Next question I have here: the probability that more than four will be diabetic. Well, more than four would be. I'm gonna I'm gonna write three, four, five. Six, number of successes, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Okay, so probability of more than four, is that what it said, more than four? More than four, that would be the probability of five, six, seven, eight, or nine, or 10. That'd be all of those added together, right? Well, it's gonna be cumbersome to like, you know, do each one of these individually and so on and so forth. Right, but you know I have a better way of doing this, and that is I'm going to click in here by four, and I'm going to say equals binome dist parentheses, and now let's see for four the probability of getting four. I'm going to say the number of successes is four, comma the number of trials is ten, comma the probability of success is point one, and you know what I'm going to say now instead of false I'm going to say true for cumulative. What's that going to do? That is now going to add up the probabilities for four, three, and matter of fact, you know, I, I, I'd rather do this not in there, <coughs> rather do this out here. Equals binome dist parentheses four comma ten comma point one comma true. And that's going to give me the probability for four, three, two, one, and zero all the probabilities that are less than five. And it gives you 99, 98.53. So what are all the, the total number of probabilities? It's equal to one. So the probability of getting five or more out of 10 is gonna be equal to one minus the probability of getting four or less, which is gonna be about one, uh, a two and a thousand. Get it, right? Pretty simple, right? Pretty simple when you use this function. Okay, so I could literally <coughs> use either one of these ways of doing that. I could individually find all the probabilities. Here, watch this. I'm going to do this in an interesting way. I'm going to say equal binome this, binome this, parentheses. And instead of putting in the number of successes as a number, I'm going to click on this box. Oops. I forget something. <coughs> Binome dist number, comma, uh, number of trials is 10, comma, point 0.1, comma, and false. And I'm going to hit enter. Okay, so now I'm going to take that and I'm going to copy that function. Notice how it went down from 19 to 6%. I'm going to take that function and I'm going to, oops, I'm going to take that function and I'm going to copy it down to all these other boxes. <coughs> so each one of these. Is a pro this is a probability of four. If you look up there, B5, uh, of four, uh, uh, of five, of six, of seven, and so on and so forth. The individual probabilities of each. What did we say this was over here? This is the probability of, uh, of more than four. Let's give, let's give this a try this way. So let's see if we get the same thing. Probability of five or four, four or, more, or more than four. Oh, look, came out to be the same thing. 
So that's a pretty ver uh, a versatile function that we have here. And the true and the false are just telling you that that number, that that number of, uh, uh, excuse me, true or false, are telling you that the probability includes not just the outcome of that number, but all that are less than it. So the probability, what's, what if I had put the probability in here I, for zero, I put 0, 10, 0 0.1, and false. What if I put true in there? What do you think I'll get? 0 0.1, what was that? 0, comma, 10 trials, 0 0.1, comma, whoops, comma, 0 0.1, and true for, for that. Well, how many numbers are there below zero? None. So I should get the same re I should get the same number when I say true or false there because there's nothing below it anyway. Oh, I forgot the equal sign. And indeed I get the same number. Okay. So let's see what the next problem is here. Four or more. Okay. So <clears throat> study indicates four percent of Americans teenagers have tattoos. You know, I probably wrote that that thing about 20, this question about 20 years ago, right? If I were to guess now, I'd say 40% of American teenagers have tattoos, right? I'm not going to ask, you know, I, I know I'm a teacher, I'm not going to ask, but I'm going to assume that, you know, that people get tattoos now. When I was a kid, if I got a tattoo, my, my parents would have beat me within a, an inch of my life, I guarantee you. But at any rate, and I grew up in the neighborhood, it was all Italian and Jewish, and the, and the Jewish kids couldn't get tattoos because Back in those days, you couldn't be buried in a Jewish cemetery without a tattoo. Or at least that's what the parents told them. I don't know if that's really true or not. That's what, that's what my Jewish ones, their parents would tell them. But at any rate, so yeah, ta tattoos now have become mainstream. Right? I mean, uh, it really, un uh, where it would have been unusual to see people with tattoos, very common now. <clears throat> We're going to stick with that 4% anyway, without checking to see if that's really true. Maybe I'll take a quick peek when we take a break. Okay, st uh, st study in the case that 4% of American teenagers have tattoos. So what's that? That's our probability, our p-value, 0.04. You randomly sample 30 teenagers. What's that? That's our sample size, n. Uh, what is the likelihood that exactly three will have a tattoo? I'm going to let you guys do it, figure that out. Okay, bring up Excel on your computers and plug it in. Exactly three. Not three or more, not three or less, just exactly three. I'm going to give you a chance to do it, and then I'll, I'll do it with you. One of the frustrating things about doing classes online, I, I can't tell what people are doing at home. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I think you had enough time, so I'm going to go ahead and show you the way I would do this. So it's 0.4. Uh, the sample size is 10, n is 10, and the we're interested in exactly three. Okay, so let me get fresh area over here. So <laughs> equal binome disk parentheses and the number of successes was exactly three. Did I say exactly three? I said exactly three. Comma out of thirty, comma point uh, point oh four is the probability for any in the, any particular individual, comma, and now would I say false or true? Well, I said exactly three, not three, two, or one, not one of three, not less than three but just exactly three out of 30. So cumulative would be false. We don't want to add together all the, all the uh, possibilities up to that or under that and so on. 
So it's about 9%, 8.6%, 0.086. Okay, that's probability, which makes sense because <clears throat> if, if the probability is 4%, probability that we get exactly three out of 30, that's like, ten, that would be 10%. So you wouldn't expect that to happen quite as often as maybe getting uh, two out of 30 or one out of 30, something closer to the, what the prevalence of tattoos in that population are. <clears throat> okay, so what's the likelihood that we'll have three or fewer tattoos? Okay, I'm gonna do that two ways, three or fewer, okay? So let's see, zero tattoos, one tattoo, two tattoos, three tattoos, four tattoos, and so on. So three or fewer, okay, is equal to binome disc, Parentheses. I'm going to repeat that 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 exactly three. Um, actually, to tell you the truth, I should do it this way. It'll be easier rather than copy up. I'll copy. Up. I'll do it a bit more natural. Binome dist parentheses and oops, oops, sorry. And it's going to be the number of successes, which is the number here, comma thirty trials, comma point oh four, comma. And I'm going to say false because I want the probability of each individual outcome. So at least the most, uh, that's what among the most likely would be zero out of 30, right? I think one out of 30 would be more, a bit more likely. But we'll copy this down. It'll use one, two, three, or four number alongside there for each one of them. Yeah, one is the most likely outcome. Notice here, it's kind of take a look at this, you know, that, that hump and then like <coughs> goes down on either side of that. Okay, so the probability of exactly three tattoos we saw was 0.086. Three or fewer is gonna be the sum of these numbers, of these of three, two, or one, and zero. And I could also do that by using true for cumulative. Binome disk, parentheses, oops, open parentheses, and three comma, uh, 30.04, comma, and I'm going to type true. And what do we get? Oops, I went off my, I went, there's a control panel on my screen, so I can't see what I did there. Okay, I didn't close parentheses. Oh, uh, so yeah, I put it, yeah, instead of putting a comma. There we go. Point saying it came out the same thing by using false, true, instead of false. This one I added them all together, this one I just used true. So it accumulated the probabilities for everything below three and gave it to me all together. So that's the answer to that question. What's the, what's the next question? Four or more will have tattoos. Well, now we're getting into, you're gonna to have to parse the question. Um, I, they, that's a grammatical term. You know, they, they use it in computers too, parsing. It's like when you break up a sentence noun, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, I, I uh, 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 can, you know, the conjunctions, uh, uh, press of it, uh, uh, prepositional phrase, whatever, right? You break it up into different groups, nouns, and verbs, and so on. So they use it in programming also, parsing in the program. You know, uh, here's the active part, here's the object, here's the thing. And when you read a program, you parse it. You, you look at what uh, all the different parts are. <coughs> so so um, uh, you have to take the question, you gotta parse it, you gotta say, so what do I, what is this telling me? What's the information? Four or more will have tattoos. Does that include the number four? The answer is yes, four or more, right? If it said more than four, it wouldn't include the number four, right? So we would have to, so in this case, since it includes the number four, what I really need to do here is I have to say it's equal to one minus binome, binome this, parentheses, four, three, comma, 30, comma, point, point oh four, <coughs> comma, true. <coughs> what is that? That's the probability for three or fewer. And we're going to subtract that from one, leaving four or more. And it's going to come out to that number. Right? If we had said more than four, Right. Well, then, in that case, we would use more than four. Uh, we would have we would have to say <coughs> we would have to say four comma thirty, so that we get the probability of four and fewer. 
So we leave behind when we said tracks from one probability for five, six, seven, and eight. We had said just more than four, not four or more. So you got to be a little bit careful with that. There, there, I'm, you get one, one or two examples and it's on an exam or something like that. You'll see some on the homework as well as the practice. But that's one of the things you got to be a little bit careful about. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> where's this lead now? Well, you know, we got another kind of distribution that we work with even a bit more than the binomial distribution. But it's got certain similarities as well. Let me close this. Uh, actually, I'll just minimize it. Okay. And let's see if I can find it here. I think we went through all of these already. Yeah, we went through all of those already. And let me open up this. Yeah, these documents are on Blackboard, so you have it. On Blackboard, let me just ma ma mention this on Blackboard. You know, when they, when they uh, post this class, in the various descriptions on uh, Hunter, other schools, also other people from other schools come here and take some classes here as well. When they post this class, a lot of times different students have a different take on what the, what the class is. In other words, brick and mortar, hybrid, um, and, and so on and so forth. So, so I'm never sure what everybody in the class has seen or what their expectations are. So typically I kind of try, you know, there are students that signed up, they thought it was just strictly an online class. There are other students that signed up and thought it was a brick and mortar class, right? So how, how about you guys? How many of you guys thought it was a brick and mortar course strictly? No, online? Did you know that there was going to be an in, in class session or part also, or is that a surprise to you? Surprise? Okay, good. Well, it helps, right? You know, at least that it's available. Also, if those people that were online at home, if they type questions to the chat box, since it's online, they could get questions answered at the same time, where you guys have the advantage of just getting my attention here. Like, uh, they, they could, or at least, you know, like showing that look of shock on your face when I say something and it doesn't make sense to you. I, I could get <coughs> get some feedback, but they this is actually them also because if they want, they can take part in that. This is well that way. So at any rate, <coughs> um, and I think a lot of people are here come here to this class because they have another class after this, so they show up for this class even though they maybe signed up for it and gone by. They show up because they got something before and after anyway. So I, I'm glad to hear I'm as entertaining as like sitting in the cafeteria or something like that. So let's say now that let's go back to what we were talking about here, which is uh, the material that we have on Blackboard in terms of like how this material is structured. I'm going to go into up oh, not that. But yeah, that's what I want. Okay, seven fifty. <coughs> Just so you see what I can explain to you what's on here. Weekly materials and material for each. Uh, the, oh, I didn't turn it on. It's hidden from you. My goodness. Okay, actually, I got, it's got the right date, and it's just not turned on. How did I do that? Or how did it turn? I don't know if I turned it on to turn itself off or what the story is. Okay, this should be visible to you guys now. So in here, <coughs> you will see the various documents that I'm using here. Here's that, you know, like the drawing, the, uh, the uh, formula for the binomial distribution, uh, 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 the the uh, Excel, uh, uh, the, oh, actually, you, this is an extra thing, a little bit extra help, which lists various functions for what we're about to use, which is a normal distribution. You don't have to worry about that right now, but this supplemental material, in addition to the binomial distribution problems, which we just did, we're also going to get into the normal distribution right now. The document I have open right now is lab session normal distribution empirical rule. I have a suggestion for reading up here. And what I've been doing is I've been posting both the reading sections for edition three and edition four. Okay, it's a little bit different. It's really the same material. I didn't see that much of a change in it, but they added an extra chapter up front. So if you have edition four on the, uh, if you happen to be using edition four and open, uh, open intro statistics, it's section 4.1 to 4.4. If you're using the older one, yes. I'm sorry. 
third edition? Did I, did I make a mistake here? Oh, well, both of them say third edition? Oh, you're right. Look at that. Okay, hang on a second. You, now you got you to get, you, you know, like in The Wizard of Oz, where you finally get to look behind the curtain. You're going to look behind the curtain here, and you can see what I have to do to change this fourth edition. You're right. Fourth edition. Fixed, I think. <laughs> Good. Fixed. Yeah, so it's a little bit different in terms of like chapter structure, but the material is almost exactly the same, at least up to this point. <clears throat> now, what you also have here is you have a pre recorded lecture and a, a PowerPoint slides and a pre recorded lecture from a previous uh, uh, a lecture, a previous semester, a previous lecture, and very often will be another professor. And I put this up here because then you get a perspective of it from someone else as well. So sometimes, you know, people learn well the way I've described it. Some people learn well the, uh, this other way, but it gives you another chance to look at this. And believe it or not, sometimes I, I do the same lecture and I'm on my game and I'm doing it pretty well. Other times I'm off my game and I'm not doing it that well. But this gives you, a, you have a recording here that you can play <coughs> if you missed the live lecture or something like that. I'm recording this as well. So you will see that uh, at the end of the day, you know, within 24 to 48 hours at the top here, you will see a recording of what we're doing right now as well. So you got the choice of re replaying that or actually playing the lecture section here. And then this is this is also a lab exercise here, kind of the same stuff we're doing in, in class. A lot of the same stuff we're doing in class here. So you have a lot of options here on how to examine this, how, how to play with this material. <coughs> so at any rate, so that's what you have here. I'm glad I looked there because I thought that that was going on. Okay, so a lot of times we deal with distributions in nature that are based on chance, right? Like, for instance, just as we talk about uh, uh, people who have diabetes, people who don't have diabetes, and so on and so forth, a lot of times we're dealing with situations that involve, when we do our sampling, that involve some chance. For instance, let's say that I sample 100 people, right? And I and let's say that we happen to know that the average BMI for those hundred people is equal to twenty six. Okay, so that's the average BMI, right? Now I sample hundred people. Now I'm gonna I'm just gonna say I'm gonna round it off to whole numbers. Some of these people are gonna come up twenty six. Some of these people are gonna twenty twenty seven. Some of these people are gonna be twenty four. Some of these people thirty. Some of these people twenty, and so on and so forth. But the average, the arithmetic average, we know is 26. By the way, I'm using mu here. What does that represent? That represents not a sample, but the population, right? Okay, that's called the parameter. Okay, when we when we talk about a sample, I'm, I'm saying that the uh, mean for this population is 26. <clears throat> what we get when we take a sample of 100 people, right? Sometimes we may get 26, but sometimes we get 25 as the average, sometimes 27. Right, because it's just chance. Because we're sampling 100 people, we may just by chance get not exactly the same as the population. Right. So if we were to show, if we were to do this over and over again, or if we were to show what the what the average BMI is, the BMI for this entire population would look like, well, we would expect that we would see, and I'm going to show it as a histogram. Right. I'm going to say, okay, how many people have a BMI of 26? Well, that's going to be the most frequent outcome, just like our flipping a coin. How many people have a, a BMI of 25 or 27? Well, that's going to be our next most frequent outcome, right? On 27, right? How about 24 and 28? How about 23 and, 20, and 29 and so on and so forth until we get down to 20 or 19, until we get up to 35 or 40. And what's going to happen? We're not going to see as many people that have BMIs in that range. It's just natural. This natural distribution tends to be centered in such a way that most of the people in the middle, but we get fewer and fewer people on the uh, uh, that are uh, extreme from that middle of the distribution. If we make these narrow enough, instead of 25, 25.1, 25.2, all these bars, or 25.01, 25, if we make them that narrow enough, we start to notice that this forms 
a distinctive distribution, similar to the binomial distribution, it's spell it's spell shaped. Right? That's one of the properties of this distribution. But because this is a natural phenomenon, when we take samples and it's and when, it, when uh, we take a, a thing that's random and we uh, sample a large population, <laughs> because it's a, a, a natural occurrence, we call this the normal distribution. And a lot of things have this property. <coughs> okay, so that's our normal distribution. Okay, and again, it's a, it, it, assuming that the only thing that's influenced is this chance, we expect to have this normally distributed. What do you notice about the normally normal distri di distribution? Now, here is our mean. Where's our median? In a perfectly normal distribution, the mean and the median would be the same thing, <laughs> right? If it's perfect, right? What percentage of the people are below the mean? What percentage are above the mean? 50%, right? It's symmetrical. In other words, if I folded it up, remember you, you have these little, like the origami, you ever see these things you can download and print out, and they got little folds on them and stuff like that, origami. I'm going to put a dotted line here to indicate the fold. If I folded this over, it would fit perfectly on the other side, over the other side. The, 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 the normal distribution is symmetrical. Okay, and it has a distinctive distribution. Okay, and that distinctive distribution is based on the variability in the population, the variability in the population called sigma. It has some value. Remember, we calculated sigma. Yeah, you know, we got we calculated the sum of squares of the differences. Then we calculated the variance. We divided by n minus one variance, and then we uh, took square root of that. Then that was called standard deviation, right? It, with a population, we call it sigma. With a sample, we call it just S or SD. That has a distinctive distribution, and that this this distinctive distribution is measured by the this, this sigma, this this uh, standard deviation of the population. Okay, let's say, for instance, in this case, the standard deviation is equal to five. Okay, so what does that tell us about this distribution? Well, you know, there is a actually, a, uh, that what this tells us is quite a bit about this distribution. And what I'm about to show you are estimates. This is called the empirical Either the empirical rule or the empirical formula. One of the other doesn't really matter. So I'm going to draw our normal distribution, just as I kind of described it here. It's actually symmetrical. I didn't draw it perfectly symmetrical, but make believe I did. And the mean is here in the middle, 26. And the standard deviation I said was going to be equal to five. There are certain properties of the normal distribution which fit in very well here in terms of helping us to understand how this population is distributed, assuming that it is actually normally distributed. One of those properties is, is that 50% of the population is below the mean and 50% is above the mean. But you wanna know something, there's, some, there's even more that we can tell from that. If I look at the standard deviation, which is five, right? If I go one standard deviation below the mean, which would be 21, Go five below, and I'm going to look at this, and five above, which would be 31. Sixty-eight <clears> percent, <throat> roughly, to the approximation. Sixty-eight percent of the population is between 21 and 31. <clears throat> you know, I should have used maybe three. Three would probably be more practical. Right, I'm going to make it three. 23 and 29, right? 68% of the population is between 23 and 29. One standard deviation below me, one standard deviation above me. Okay, now I'm gonna go two standard deviations out. How far is two standard deviations? Well, that's six, two times standard deviation. Six below this would be 20, and six above this would be 32. Okay, whoops, 32. So, as it happens, based on the empirical rule, I know that that tells me 
that approximately 95% of the population is within two standard deviations below the mean and two standard deviations above the mean. I'm going to show you one more, and that is three standard deviations below the mean and three standard deviations above the mean. And that would be, in our case, that would be 17, which is a very low BMI, and um, uh, <coughs> uh, 35, not, not so unusual on the high end, but on the low end, that's pretty unusual. So 35. Okay. And that would represent 99.7% of the population would be between three standard deviations below the mean and three standard deviations above the mean. Now, the really cool thing about this <coughs> is that this relationship <coughs> holds up, <coughs> this relationship holds up for any normal distribution. I'm going to draw another one. Okay, and this is going to be, let's say, blood pressure or something like that. If I told you that the mean blood pressure in this population is equal to 100, and the standard deviation for the blood pressure is equal to 10, okay? If I draw a normal distribution, if this is truly normally distributed, the mean is 100, okay? Here's the mean, okay? And the standard deviation is equal to 10. One standard deviation below the mean, one standard deviation above the mean, will represent 68% of the population. That means that 68% of the population is between, has a blood pressure between 90 and 120. How about if I went to two standard deviations out? That would be 20 away from me. 20 below, that'd be 80. And 100, 100 and, I'm sorry, that's 110. 120. 80 and 120 would represent 95% of the population. And again, if I went to three standard deviations out, almost all of the population would be between 70 and 130, <coughs> right? 99.7%. Well, that's pretty convenient, right? To be able to kind of estimate how a normal distribution is distributed for a population. And all this, remember I told you how important that standard deviation is going to be to us. This is the reason why it's so important. Now, samples may not distribute themselves exactly like the population, because there's a certain amount of chance in there and stuff when you, when you uh, sample them. But <coughs> this, you know, it's just a true normal uh, distribution. This is what we'll be dealing with. And I want to do one more thing here. And that is, I'm going to draw this again. <coughs> okay. And I'm going to give it a little bit different numbers here. Mu is equal to let's say 70, maybe it's a test score or something like that. Sigma is equal to eight. Eight. Really easy to read, eight. So I'm going to say, this here's the middle, which is 70, the mean. And I am going to say, okay, so this is, this is a score of 62. And this is a, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is 70. Score 62, and this is a score of 78. What percent of the students got a, got a uh, grade between 62 and 78? How much? Yeah, 68. How do you know that? Because this is minus one standard deviation below the mean and plus one standard deviation above the mean. What percentage of the students got between 62 and 70? Now, what did I tell you about the normal distribution? It's symmetrical. Right? So, can you tell me now what percentage you got between 62 and 70? It's the same area there as it is between 70 and 78. So, overall, if it's 60, 68%, that means that each one of these areas is 34%. Right? Everybody agree with me on that? Any disagreements on that? Nope? Okay, so I'm going to go down two standard deviations below the mean and plus two. And that would be another eight below 62, uh, 16 below 70, which would be uh, uh, 54. And 16 above, which would be 86, right? What percentage of, of students got between a score of 54 and 86? Right, and guys remember what two standard deviations above, two standard deviations below, what was it again? 95%, right? 
<laughs> what percentage of students got under a 54? 95% is in the middle here, right? So what's left? 5%, right? So what does this not account for? It accounts for the area in here and the area in here, which has got to be 5%. So since it's symmetrical, each end here is how much? 2.5%, right? And this is 2.5%. Because if the middle is 95 and you got two, two spaces left on either side, they're symmetrical, they're equal, then it's got to be 2.5% each. Okay? Good. So now I'm going to introduce another little term here. I am going to call this negative two, negative one, plus one, plus two. I'm going to call that a Z score. <coughs> the, and the Z score is the same thing as saying the number of standard deviations above or below the mean, right? Just a number, right? And in different distributions, depending on what the mean and the sigma are, is two standard deviations below, in other words, negative two, z score negative two, it's going to be a different number, 54 in this case. And it might have been 70 before, or it might have been 80 in the first, whatever it was in the first or second cases we looked at, right? But it's, it's always going to be two standard deviations, one standard deviation, one standard deviation, two standard deviations. Okay? And we're going to call that z score. So I, wonder what, uh, I can tell you a lot of stuff about this distribution, like for instance, if this is 34%, this is 34%, and this from here down is 50%, that leaves 16% from here down. And if this is 2.5%, that leaves 13.5% uh, what, what, in here and 2.5% here, right? There's a lot of stuff you could do with this. You could play around with this quite a bit. All right, 16 percent, two and a half percent, 18 and a half percent. So all it is is 18 and a half percent. <clears throat> no, I'm wrong. Uh, 16 percent less two and a half percent is 13 and a half percent, right? Two and a half percent, 13, right? And the same thing happens up here, right? You can play around with this with these different areas. Okay, so let's take a break and I will drink some juice, start my voice a little bit, and we'll get back to work on this in about 10 minutes, okay? Okay, so you guys don't like to. Ah. This conference will okay, now so be recorded. Now. And. Um, okay, so here is a here's a little bit more accurate version of the um, uh, empirical rule. Okay, it's really 34.1. But again, remember, remember this is an estimate. Here you can look at that less than three, uh, further away than three cent deviations above or above uh, or below the uh, uh, mean is quite a ways away from the mean and, and very few, probably finding someone in this population that's that far away from the mean is pretty small at the same normal distribution. And remember, for every distribution, three cent deviations below or three cent deviations above can be a different number because it's based on whatever the standard deviation is for that particular population. Okay, so let's look at a few possible questions that we might ask you about that. Assume that the heights of adult Caucasian men have a mean of 68 inches and a standard deviation of four inches. Find the probability that a randomly chosen individual, and again, we can look at this distribution as, as either being the actual population itself distributed uh, in this graph, or we can look at it as the probability that any individual would be in that group. So in other words, if half the population is below the mean, let's say the mean here is 100, below 100, right? Then if you randomly select someone from this population, you'd expect a 50-50 chance that he's going to be below the mean, 100 or above the mean 50-50 chance. And you'd expect a <coughs> about a 14% chance, a 16% chance that he would be further away than one standard deviation below the mean and so on. So let's take a look at uh, applying this. A mean of 68, a standard deviation of four, what's the probability a randomly chosen individual that has a height greater than 68 inches, right? So what would that be? 68 is the mean, greater than 68 inches is gonna be 50%. Okay, everybody comfortable with that? How about between 64 and 72 inches? 
What was the standard deviation again? It's four, right? And the mean was 68. So four, one standard deviation below is 64, one standard deviation above is 68 is 72, right? And so what percentage of individuals here, what's the probability that we would choose an individual, randomly select one individual that's between 64 and 60 and 72 inches. One standard deviation below, one standard deviation above. What's the probability going to be? The probability is going to be 68%. Because that's how much of the population is in that range. <coughs> how about between 60 and 76 inches? The mean is 68. How many standard deviations below the mean is 60? Two. The, uh, the, the uh, mean is 68. How many standard deviations above 68 is 76 inches, two. So two standard deviations below the mean, two standard deviations above the mean. What percentage of the population is in that, in that range? Right, 95% of the population is in that range, two standard deviations above <coughs> to two standard deviations below. Okay, so we would expect the chances of us picking an individual in that range will be 95%, right? What's the probability of picking someone that's not in that range? Well, 95% of the probability of picking someone in that range and the probability of picking someone that's not in that range, in other words, less or more, is gonna be 5%. And similarly, what's the probability of picking someone that's less than 60 inches tall? It's gonna to be 2.5%. Or more than 76 inches tall, it's gonna to be 2.5%. <coughs> Again, this is all a matter of taking what we can see here <coughs> from this distribution and applying it and, get, and using it to extract as much information about the population as we can. Assume the heights of adult Caucasian women have a mean of 63 inches and a standard deviation of three inches. What percentage of this in this population have a mean height greater than 63 inches? Somebody yell it out. Right, the mean 63 inches, what percentage has a, a height greater than 63 inches? Yeah, 50%, right? Okay, how about greater than 66 inches? Oh, okay, well, hang on a second here. Now, is, would it be better if I draw this? Yeah, okay, let me draw it. <coughs> Oops. Is that the way? Okay, so what do we have here? We have a mean of 63 and a standard deviation of three. <clears throat> a mean of 63 and a standard deviation of three. So what, what percentage of population would we expect to be bigger than 63 inches? That's an easy one, right? 50%. Half of the population would be greater than the mean, half is going to be less than the mean. How about greater than 66 inches? Ah, okay, it gets a little complicated. 66 inches. How many standard deviations above the mean is 66 inches? That's plus one, right? That's one standard deviation. So how much is, what area is between the mean and one standard deviation above the mean? 34, right? Because we said one, if you include the one below, one above, that's 34. So what percentage of the population is above 66? Bingo. That's it, 16% of the population. Okay, very good. Okay, so that's really what this is just going on. How about less than 60 inches? Okay, so this is minus one standard deviation. So this is 34% again, leaving again 16%. Okay, okay so stuff's pretty simple, right? You can get a little confusing when you really start, when the numbers get a little bit more complicated. Let's take a look at this next one. The gestation time for humans is a mean, has a mean of 266 days and a standard deviation of 25 days. <clears throat> what percentage of pregnancies would you expect to be more than 291, less than 241, less than 241, or greater than 291? Let me preface this by saying we're going to make believe that this is a normal distribution. It's not really a normal distribution, right? Because it's very uncommon. To, to have someone uh, uh, deliver, you know, at 400 days, right? That doesn't happen, right? So above the, the mean, above 266 days, not uncommon. You might go to 280, 275, right? 
but it's not uncommon to have a premature baby that's like 100 days less than this or 150 days less than this, right? That's not as uncommon. So it's not really, it's actually, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try. It's actually a skewed distribution, right? In other words, here is the mean, and most of the women are around the mean, right? Like that, not that many are above the mean, but then below the mean, there's a lot of a lot of deliveries that are below the mean, premature babies. Right? These premature, so it really looks something like this. We're going to assume it's a normal distribution, just so we can play with the numbers. <coughs> and what was it? We said two sixty six and twenty five. Okay, so making believe it's a normal distribution. Oops. Mean is two sixty six. And standard deviation is equal to 25. So the question was, what percentage of, of uh, pregnancies would you expect to be more than 291 days? Okay, more than 291 days. <clears throat> you know, I'm getting confused here because now I got to do a little bit of math, right? So I'm looking, say this is 291 days. I want to know what this area is up here. More than 291 days. <clears throat> you know what I'm going to do to make this harder to make a mistake? I'm going to create a formula. I'm going to say that the Z score is equal to the number I'm interested in, I'll call it X, minus mu, the difference between the value I'm looking for and the mean, divided by the standard deviation. So let's see what that winds up here. That winds up being 291 minus 266 over the standard deviation, which is 25. That's 25 more than the mean is, right? So the least score is one plus one because on the right side, right? The X is bigger than the mean is. Well, that Z score and that number standard deviation is one. So what percentage are greater than 291? Right? That's about 16%. <coughs> okay, now let's go back and take a look. Less than 241 days. Okay, if we use the same formula, 241 minus 266 over 25. Well, this is minus, minus 25 over 25. That's equal to negative one standard deviation, right? And what area, what area, what did it say? Uh, I forget what the problem is. Uh, less than 244 days. So less than 244 days, is similarly, is 16%, right? Because the middle part's 34, 34, 68%. Well, less than that. Okay, so how about... Less than 241 days or greater than 291 days. Okay, well, now everything that's outside of this uh, uh, 241 and 291, in other words, the 16% down here and the 16% up here qualify as less than 241 and greater than 291. So that probability is how much? 32%. Again, these are round numbers. They're not exact, right? Because we're using the empirical rule. But there's an estimate, even if it's a perfectly normal distribution, uh, it's still an estimate. Okay, so we introduced the idea of calling it the z-score and calculating the z-score. I mean, we're doing that when we were working with 100 and 90. I mean, that was easy enough for us to do in head, but numbers get a little more complicated. It's nice to be able to use that little formula, especially when we start to get into fractional values. Assume the heights of adult U.S. women have a mean of 63 inches and a standard deviation of 2 inches. Okay, let's do that one. I'm going to beat this to death until there's no way we can't, we don't know what this is. Okay, what did I say this was? 63 inches and 2 inches. <coughs> 63. And the standard deviation is equal to two. That's our mean. Okay. What's the probability percentage? Of, what percentage of women would you expect to have a mean or probability of choosing one person? Okay, that's less than 63 inches. Of course, what is that? That's 50% again, because it's the lower half, the half below the mean. Less than 62 inches. Oh, my goodness. 62 inches. Less than 62 inches. We're interested less that area in here represents the number of people in this population and the probability of selecting one person that would be below 62. And what is, how many standard, well, let me use the formula. Z is equal to 62 
minus 63 over 2 is equal to how many standard deviations? Negative 1 half or negative 0.5 standard deviations. We got a problem. The empirical rule only is, you know, unless we want to try and do it by eye, which is not a good idea. The empirical rule only gives us this data for an, a, 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 a number of standard deviations. That's an integer. Right, it's just a rough rule for us to work with. So what are we going to do about this now? Well, fortunately, this, just like our binomial distribution, we saw this ugly equation that described what the binomial distribution looks like, that curve looks like, right? There's an ugly, there's an ugly formula for the normal distribution, just as ugly, maybe more ugly than that one. And I'm going to show it to you briefly. We'll get it off the screen as quickly as possible. That's a binomial, so that we don't be we're not intimidated by it. <laughs> okay. <coughs> this is what determines <coughs> the height of that normal distribution at different values. Why why represent the height of the curve? And so if you want to calculate each point on the curve and actually calculate that curve. You would use this formula, where well one over sig one over sigma times the square root of pi times e e is a natural log uh, number that the natural logarithm is based on two point seven three something. My, that, don't worry about that. That's based on I, 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 we don't want to get into that right now. To e to the minus x minus mu squared over two times sigma squared. We really need to know that. Well, we really you know uh, really. Doesn't make sense for us to be concerned about this, but just know that 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 all of this is based on this formula. The the areas under these distributions, the normal distribution, is based on this formula, which is the which is a natural outcome of figuring out what the probabilities are based on chance. Okay, so that formula is going to be cumbersome or impossible for us to use to do any real work with. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to use a table which is based on that formula. Okay, and I'm going to show you a table. I like to use this version of it. I put it up on Blackboard. There's a version of it that's almost identical to it that's on uh, that's in your uh, open intro uh, the statistics textbook. I think it's pretty much the same table. It is. It's, it's the numbers are exactly the same. Uh, the layout might be a little bit different. Is what I'm driving at. I, I'm so used to using this one. I like using this one. <coughs> I like the cut. It's colorful. I like it. Okay, so where did I put it now? So let's see, let's see. Uh, 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 uh. <coughs> it is called Agresti. Here it is, Z tables, Agresti. It's called Z tables because it's a Z score, table with standard deviations of Z scores. And again, you're going to find this on your, <coughs> you're going to find this on Blackboard, along with the other files. And you could also, here, if I go to, I open open intro. That's third edition. Is the fourth edition? I open the fourth edition. I haven't actually looked at it here. All the way to the back. You should see it among the tables at the back. Oh, no. oh, there it is. <coughs> this is the normal distribution. Same table I'm going to be using uh, momentarily here. This is my ver the version I like. Okay, so this table tells us <coughs> what it tells us is you notice that this this area says Z score, and then it has a, a grayed out area below that. This is cumulative cumulative probability. Just like our binomial distribution, cumulative meant everything below that is included in your calculation. So whenever we, if we go down here, see these Z scores? If the Z score number standard deviations is two, right? If it's two, then the numbers to the right of that represent the areas below that standard deviation of two. Remember standard deviation was two, on a negative two, plus two, that was 95% of the population. So the, so the uh, empirical rule told us how, what, what percentage of these Z scores, what percentage of the population 
at a z-score below negative two. To the right of negative two, we said about two and a half percent, right? 95% and two and a half, two and a half in the other corner. Let's see what it is here. If I go to a z-score, two, negative two standard deviations, if I go to the right, I get the area that's in this gray area, which would be the area to the right of two standard deviations below the mean. Okay, and then what does it tell me it is? It tells me it's, oh, it's not two and a half. That would be 0 0.0250, two and a half, right? What does it tell me it is? It tells me it's 0 0.0228. Very close, but not exactly the same thing. Why is that? Because the empirical formula was an estimate. It's a rough estimate. This is the actual value. So all of these things in here are areas. <clears throat> now, if you go all the way down to negative 3.4 standard deviations, in other words, all the way down at the end of the scale, this is really asymptotic, theoretically. It doesn't go to zero, right? So, so if you go all the way down here, well, then the area for it that's to the left of, a C of negative 3.4 standard deviations is a tiny, tiny percentage of the uh, distribution, right? If it exists at all, right? So one standard deviation below the mean, we said that was 16%. It's really 15.87%. So this is much more accurate than the empirical formula. <clears throat> now, didn't we just have a problem? What was our z-score on the problem we just uh, were talking about? It was negative 0.5, right? <clears throat> Let's go to negative 0.5. The area to the left of that is point, point 0.3085. So this area <coughs> is equal to point 0.0, zero <coughs> point, what was it, 3.085, or a little less than 31%. That's how we use that table. Okay, what was the next question that we had there? <coughs> uh, less than 62 inches greater than 66 inches, 66 inches, that would be a, let's see, 66 inches, greater than 66 inches. Okay, that would be up here. So the z-score for 66 inches would be 66 minus 63, x minus the mean over the standard deviation two. That's a positive number this time, right? Because why that which makes sense, right? The mean which is going to be equal to 1.5, right? It's going to be 3 over 2 is 1.5. So it's a standard deviation, so a standard deviation of 1.5. Let's go to what, plus 1.5 here. Now, notice these are all negative numbers, right? That's because the second page has all the positive numbers. And you'll notice that if it has a positive number, it's to the right side of the mean. So those areas below are much bigger, right? No matter of fact, the z-score is 0 is the mean. Right? And what's below the mean? 50% of the distribution. So if I go to 1.5, 1.50, it's from that all the way down to the left is 90.9332. If I go back here, I can tell that this is, <coughs> whoops, let it get away. <coughs> Everything from here down represents 0.9332. So what area is in here? That's going to be equal to 1 minus 0.9332. And what is that going to be? That's going to be 0.06. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, 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 0668. Does that look right? If we add them together, it should add to 1. Carry 1, carry 1. I think that's right. That's about 6.68%, or about 0 0.0668, if I show you the proportion, as a probability or a proportion. So, what have we introduced here? We've introduced a way to identify number standard deviations uh, in relation to the mean that doesn't have to be a whole number. It doesn't have to be an estimate, right? We can use a table to figure that out. So now, let me see if I can't. We can do it in terms of the next one. Oh. <clears throat> uh, body temperature of adults have a mean of 98.6. That's not really true, I found that. And a standard deviation of 0.6. The probability that a randomly selected individual has a mean body temperature, 
uh, uh, one probably a random second has a mean body temperature greater than 99 degrees. 0. 0.6. <coughs> okay. I need to get back here. Okay. 98.6. And I want to know what's the probability that, uh, and then, uh, what did I say standard deviation was? Anybody remember? <coughs> was, where is it? Here it is. Uh, 0. 0.6. 0. 0.6. And I want to know the probability that we would find an individual, a randomly select an individual at its population and it's and his temperature would be greater than 99 degrees. <clears throat> so what's my Z score for 99 degrees? It's 99.99, excuse me, 99 minus nine, let me redo this. 99 minus 98.6 over 0.6. And what is that equal to? That's equal to 0.4 over 0.6 is equal to 0 0.667, let's say, I'll stop there. And that's a plus, right? Because it's on the right side of the, so I'm looking for the area that's in here. Now notice the table does not give us that area directly. What's it gonna give us? It's gonna give us the area from there down when I look up this positive Z score, right? So I gotta be careful with that. <coughs> 0.667, I'm looking for now. Okay, so, Point six, point zero, a C score point zero six. Uh oh, I only have, I only have. What about the six? What about the rest of that? Well, you know, the table, <coughs> the table. Oh, yeah. why am I think that have? Oh, because this is the ball here. Right? The table only goes so far. It only gives me three significant digits, including the number in front of the decimal place. So I can't get, I, you know, I need to, let's say 0 0.06, what about the 67? Well, if you notice that there's 10 columns here, and the reason there's 10 columns here is because each one of these numbers to the left, to the right of that number, 0 0.06 or 0 0.1, 0 0.1, represents the next decimal place of the Z score. So this would be, this number, 0 0.7, 7, 0 0.7257, uh, represents the area that's represented by 0 0.60 z-score. 0.61 is 0 0.7291. 0 0.62, 3, 4, 5, 6. I'm going to round off to 0.67. 7, so the closest we have here is the z-score for 0 0.67. And that would be this number here. Right? See what's happening here is, is that... This table, that's the way this table is organized, so you can get three significant digits. In this case, 0 0.67 as a C-score. And what is the area to the left of that C-score? The area to the left of that C-score is 0.7486. <coughs> so this area to the left is 0.7486. So what does that leave for this area? Well, that leaves one minus 0.7486, or what does that turn out? Four, one, five, three, two, two. Point two five one four, twenty five percent. Right, seventy four, seventy five percent, twenty five percent. Okay, takes up a little bit more accurate than that. Are you comfortable with that? Okay, <clears throat> let me do one or two more of those. Actually, let me let me leave you to do. Let me let, get you guys to do one of them at least. Okay, percentage of uh, 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 so as uh, uh, elementary school teacher have a mean. I don't know what that is up there. That's kind of weird. Has a mean salary of thirty two thousand dollars with a standard deviation of three thousand dollars. Find the percentage of teachers you would expect to have a salary greater than thirty six thousand five hundred. I'll leave you, you to do that. Obviously, I was editing this and then saved the document when I was 
I saved the screwed up version of the document. After I started playing with the mouse, probably playing with the numbers, changing them, and overwrote the original document. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it up to you. The mean is 32,000. Standard deviation is 3,000. Find the percentage of teachers you would expect to have a salary greater than 36,500. And I'll wait on that. Okay, I'm gonna catch up here and, and do this. Let me just remember these numbers. 32,000 and 3,000, 36,500. Uh -uh. Oops, I don't have that open. I like to sketch it out every time. Sketch it out, it makes it less likely that you're gonna mess it up. Okay, the mean was, oh goodness, I forgot it already. <laughs> but the problem though. Well, this is the problem. Thirty-six, three, and thirty-two, three. Thirty-two thousand. Sigma is three thousand. And uh, uh, the value I'm looking for is thirty-six five. I think and we're looking for what percentage of teachers. What's the probability of selecting a teacher randomly? Either way, you can look at it either way. That's above making more than $36,500. You know, I don't know how many years ago I probably made this up, but I'm willing to bet that teachers don't, like, teachers don't make much more than that now either, right? I mean, if you're, right, where, when Utah, where was it Utah? They had the, was it Utah they had a general strike? Some, some, some state out west where all the teachers went on strike. You guys recall that, right? It was in the papers for us. And they were basically right in that range. <clears throat> and buying their own materials and, and you know, working extra jobs and stuff like that. So at any rate, um, okay, <clears throat> 32,000. So X, Z rather, is going to be equal to the value we're interested in, which is 36,500, minus <coughs> the mean, which is 32,000. And that's going to be divided by 3,000. So that is going to be, uh, 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 let's see what I got here, 3,500. Am I doing that right? 13, oh, 4,500 divided by 3,000. You know, I'm going to change this number. I'm going 131,000. Oh, no, no, 32. I'm going to call this 35,500. And mean is 32,000. So that would be instead, would be 3,500 <clears throat> over 3,000. I did that on purpose because I want an odd number. You guys realize what I did there, right? I just, I, 32,000 is the mean, and the number we're looking for, let me just write it down here. The number we're looking for is 35,000. What's the probability that a teacher would make, be making more than 35,500? Right, so, <coughs> so that's the difference. X minus the mean, it's on the right side, so it's a positive number, 3,500 over 3,000. So it's a little bit more than one standard deviation. If we're exactly, maybe I'd go to the empirical rule for exactly 3,000. And as soon as these score one, maybe I'd say, ah, it's good enough, you know, good enough for government work, I'd say. Yeah, let's use, uh, let's use one, let's use the empirical formula, but <coughs> we're not there. <coughs> so 3,500 divided by 3,000 is equal to 
right? Remember, I can only use three significant digits on that table. <coughs> so let's take a look at what that what that area for a z score z score equals 1.67. Let's see what area that represents. And remember, that area is going to be not from here up, that's which is what we're after. It's going to be from here, from 35,500 or 1.67 deviations down, right? It's going to be this area below here. Okay, so let's go to our table and look up one point. And again, we're on the positive side, so I'm using the second table. 1.6, and the third digit is going to be 0, 1, 2, again, you can look up here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1.6, <coughs> 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, it's going to be 0. 0.9525. So this area to the left of that is 0.9525. Did I do that right? There's something wrong here. No, I did that wrong. Where my where my calculator go? You shouldn't let me get away with this kind of stuff. Clear. That's 3,500 over. It's 0.16, right? 0.167. 3,500, right? Divided by 3,000. I think my antihistamine is wearing off, and I'm forgetting things. 1.17, that's what I'm after, 1.17. I'm rounding it to three significant digits because that's the table. <coughs> One point, no, 1 point, 1, 1 point 1 7, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 is 87.9%, or 0. 0.8790. <coughs> so this is, Point eight seven nine zero, and what does that leave to be above that? <coughs> it's going to be one minus point eight seven nine zero. Okay, and that would be how much would that be? That would be uh, point one two one zero, something like that. About twelve percent. Right, that's above here. One two. Now, what if it had been instead of thirty-five thousand five hundred, it had been uh, thirty-five hundred less than this would be like twenty-eight thousand five hundred. Okay, and that would have been that would have been thirty-two thousand. Uh, would have been twenty-eight thousand five hundred minus <clears throat> uh, minus thirty-two thousand. Okay, it would have been <coughs> over. <laughs> over 3,000 would have been equal to negative 1.67, right? <clears throat> and if I had asked you what percentage of teachers make less than that, you would have gone to this table and said negative, or what, I'm sorry, 1.7, 1.7, not 1.7. One, one, Making the same mistake over and over again here. <clears throat> uh, negative. 1.17, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0. 0.12. No surprise, right? Because it's symmetrical. This would be, this area would be 0. 0.1210. Just like above, just like this one above, because same number, same deviation. So if we had asked you, <coughs> what's the probability that you were randomly second teacher? Was making it 28,500, you would get this answer. And you wouldn't have to subtract it from one because the table is already giving you from that point down. And since you were looking for that anyway, that's what you're interested in. Okay, so I just want to uh, uh, mention one other thing here. And that is, is that the table is not the only way to get these values. <clears throat> the other way we can get these values is that there's functions in Excel that will help us with this. Let's go. Oh, now I left the pencil here. That's why I'm doing that. <coughs> Excuse me. I apologize for the whatever it is, but my antihistamine is wearing off and my corpse suppressant or whatever. <coughs> and uh, I'm starting to have a hard time 
avoiding it. Okay, so Excel. <coughs> okay, let's see if I can type something in here. Equal norm dist parentheses. Okay, what do I have here? Mean standard deviation x norm dist x mean standard deviation and cumulative. Okay, so <clears throat> one of the examples we just looked at was um, uh, the mean, the, the number I was looking at was 35,500. The mean was 32,000, comma, the standard deviation was 3,000. And, you know, cumulative is always going to be true here. I'll, I'll explain why in a second. True. Okay, we want the area from that point, that Z score down. 0 0.87, 0 0.878, whatever. The same number that basically we got from that table. That's the area from that point down. Okay, so why did I why is it always going to be true? Because if you say false, what that basically gives you is remember that formula that I showed you before? If you say false, what it gives you. is like in this case what it gives you is the height of this curve which you're not interested in anyway well you're really interested in areas of this curve not its height at a particular point maybe if you're maybe if you're creating that table that might be a good thing for you to know right that probability that's at the height that that exact probability but normally you, you're you're always going to be interested in the areas so you always say true for that this particular function okay the other function that we have here so that's that version you could put in the mean the standard deviation the number you're interested in and you get the area to the left of that point how about if you know what this you calculated with the z score now you want to look up the table how about equals norm oops <coughs> oops i need to do that okay to get that <coughs> equals Equals, yeah, not cooperating. Let's back up. Okay, equals norm s disk. <coughs> now, norm s disk represents the standard normal distribution. The standard normal distribution <coughs> is really a fake kind of catch all distribution. It's the distribution where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. Why are you interested in that? Well, that's what you derive that table from. You know, that's what that's where you put all that together to derive that table from. And it describes all these areas. So that's a standard normal distribution. However, what that means is now is that if I put in parentheses, notice what it wants now. It just wants the Z score. So if I put in one of the Z scores we were working with, 1.17. And just put in the z square hit enter it gives me the area from there down don't even have to it. so you can use that instead of going to the table if you calculated the z square you just put the z score in there if you want to save a step you could just use norm disk to put in the x the mean the standard deviation and just say true it'll give you the, the area well what if you know the area what, what if you know the um, uh, uh, the area, but you want to know what the z-score is? Okay, that you can use norm s dis norm inverse norm inverse parentheses, and notice now it wants to know the probability, which is 0.867, the mean, which was 35 32,000. Comma, and the standard deviation, which was 3,000. <clears throat> and norm inverse will give you the value that you were looking at. Turns out a little bit differently because we went back and forth with the number. <coughs> I rounded the number. I put it around the number. Okay, so you can use that. Now, I have given you a table that on Blackboard. <coughs> Let me go back to Blackboard. Give me a table on Blackboard, no, Excel normal distribution functions, PDF file and an Excel file. Here it is. 
In other words, if you norm estimate, if you tell it the z-score, it will give you the area to the left of that z-score. If you norm this, if you tell it x, mu, sigma, and true, it'll give you the area to the left of that point, that z-score. If you use norm inverse, you give it the probability, the area of the curve, mu and sigma, it'll give you what the value was that you started with, x. If you give it norm S inverse, if you give it the p-value, the area of the curve, it'll give you the z-score. So you can use these four functions to play around with and you just play around with them and you'll get used to them. I think I also gave you an Excel file where I think I actually might have, uh, keep closing. <clears throat> Keep closing the blackboard. <clears throat> okay, weekly material. I believe I gave you a version of it as an Excel file also. <clears throat> oh, it's the same thing in, the, in an Excel file form. Yeah, so you can play around with this. You could use this as a template and then like give it, give it a try in a few problems instead of the table, using it instead of the table. Do you need to do this in Excel? No, you could just simply use a table and a calculator if you want to, whichever way you feel more comfortable. Okay, so I'm out of tissues. My antihistamine is wearing off and my cough medicine is wearing off. So I think it's a good time to quit. Okay, I'm going, I don't know about you guys, I'm going to find some soup and I'm going to go home and go to bed. So thank you for putting up with whatever this is. And I, I hope, you know, I've been trying to stay away, make sure I, I don't get too close to you guys in terms of like, you know, 